material in order to develop new viruses. So you see the sort of uh, RNA of the virus fuses with the human host genotype, the mechanism of, of cell replication comes into play and we get new viruses uh, produced. And of course, this is exactly what uh, the virus wants to do, is it wants to um, replicate itself. Now, without doubt, we're all very aware that COVID-19 changed the world as we knew it. Uh, but I want to remind you that we have been here before. So uh, in a number of occasions, we've seen these kinds of mass epidemics, uh, perhaps the most uh, salient in the last um, uh, era has been the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. And just to remind you that 500 million People were infected during that uh, terrible epidemic, uh, largely at the time of the First World War, and an estimated 50 million died, most of them in this case, young middle-aged individuals. So quite a different um, uh, paradigm, but you see a lot of the familiar uh, signage and, and uh, policy uh, at the time uh, coming to play. So for the last uh, 12 months up until about January, all we had to rely on were these non-pharmaceutical interventions, of course, using protective equipment, including mask gloves, relying on things such as hand washing, physical spacing, and of course, these national or regional lockdowns uh, to reduce the time that people might be in touch with each other. So that really has been the mainstay in terms of our epidemiological interventions um, up until the time of vaccines. And, and uh, that is the subject of today's um, uh, talk. But let me remind you what the global COVID-19 epidemic has looked like. In contrast to that 1918 epidemic, we're looking at 194 million cases so far with 4.1 million deaths. And this is where most of the cases and most of the deaths have occurred. As you can see, the Americas very hard hit, Europe, Southeast Asia, and, and there you see Africa in its uh, position in terms of the regional epidemic. So how does it look in Africa? Well, at the moment we have this Delta variant, which is driving our third wave. Um, and what this uh, diagram shows is that we've had 6.5 million cumulative cases on the continent, um, around about an estimated 165,000 deaths. Of course, uh, there is worry that there may be an underestimation, particularly in countries where death registers um, and reporting of deaths may not be as, uh, as sophisticated as uh, other places. And you can see that... Um, more countries were involved in the second wave, but of course the third wave may still be playing out. And now moving to South Africa, where we are, here you see these very distinctive three waves that have occurred, uh, where the hospital admissions have been, the cases, and then the deaths tracking just below, and of course the ancestral variant to start, the beta variant, and then the delta variant most recently. This uh, diagram from Cheryl Baxter at the Caprisa Group really unpacking this a little more closely for us so you can overlay these three waves and see how the third wave ha um, has really struck us, particularly in the Gauteng province. So it was in January of last year that the genotype of the SARS-CoV-2 was made public from Wuhan in China. And immediately, um, people at the National Institutes of Health, uh, in particular, my good friend uh, Barney Graham, and you see him wearing his white coat in that right, together with Tony Fauci um, and the previous American president, in a lab at the NIH with Francis Collins from the NIH. The important being, thing being that mRNA vaccines had been on the cards for some time. Barney, in fact, had been working to find a solution for RSV virus, uh, a resp re uh, respiratory syncytial virus, which kills babies most often, um, and also for HIV. And so the minute he got the genotype, he sent it across to labs uh, that he was working with, including Moderna, to say, we need to get a vaccine. And it was an extraordinary, literally couple of weeks later, where they had the first uh, prototype 
They had animal data a few weeks later. And as you know, the trial started as early as June, July of last year. It was termed Operation Warp Speed in the understanding that everything would need to be expedited in terms of moving these vaccines forward. And the extraordinary picture, this is the tracker from the New York Times now showing that we have actually eight approved vaccines approved for full use in the world today, uh, 10 authorized for early use or limited use, um, and a staggering 32 in phase three trials at this moment. So really unprecedented development um, of, of a vaccine. But let's take you back for a moment and walk you through this. So what are the benefits of a vaccine in general? Well, of course, we are looking for the provision of long lasting protection. You don't have to go back constantly. The concept that we can use existing infrastructure to deliver these, uh, these vaccines, that we can overcome all the social stigma, all the behavioral difficulties of the NPIs by being able to use these vaccines and that we can protect all people at risk of infection, thought to be about 10 to 20 percent of the population that is vulnerable uh, to severe disease and death. Um, and we can aim for potential herd immunity where we're talking about covering more like 70 to 80 percent of, of the population. So. Uh, another point I want to make is that we were able to do this this quickly because we built it on the back of other vaccine foundational work. And in particular, we have been searching for an HIV vaccine for more than 30 years now. And a lot of the R&D in the foundation of looking for an HIV vaccine, as I already described with Barney Graham, was used to... Uh, if you like, expedite getting a COVID vaccine out the door. So here you see a list of, of the, the main players as they are at the moment, and they have used a mixture of uh, viral vector technology, DNA technology, RNA technology, um, and, and other strategies such as killed virus, etc. We'll come back to this, uh, but you can see here, we, we certainly have quite a nice array of uh, regimens that go from two doses to single dose uh, and require different kinds of logistical management in terms of their, their sourcing. I want to point out that the single dose, Janssen, uh, was chosen because it was thought that speed and coverage would be absolutely key to the rollout of vaccines in the world. And so Janssen or Johnson and Johnson took the very strategic uh, decision that they would come up with a single dose vaccine with very few uh, refrigeration requirements to really try and enhance speed and coverage. So here, just to give you a sense of the size of these phase threes, many of them run in parallel with others. Um, so BioNTech coming together with Pfizer in 44,000 people, their phase three in numbers of parts of the world, Moderna, as you see, mostly in the USA and so on and so forth. You can see extraordinary numbers of people mobilized for these phase threes uh, to really get us to the point where we are today. So I'm sure a number of these manufacturers uh, are now well known to you. They are in the public domain, lots spoken about these various vaccines and we'll try, try and drill down on them in a moment. So let's just uh, unpack a little bit more about each of the vaccine technology. So again, reminding you, it's an RNA vaccine comes in via the ACE2 receptor into human cells. There it, it, it hijacks the human host cell. Um, the RNA gets, if you like, added to the human DNA in order for that cell to use the mechanism to be able to produce uh, more virions. Um, and that is how the virus survives. So we know that there's a mixture of using virus vaccines, viral vector vaccines and protein based vaccines. Um, and don't worry about the detail here, I'll go into it in a moment. And of course, then the nuclear acid vaccines as well, or the gene, uh, gene uh, the, the vaccines using uh, RNA or DNA. So let's start there. Uh, the first is this concept of using either messenger RNA or spike gene on the DNA. Um, and there are a number of uh, options. Top of these, Moderna and Pfizer, of course. And here, the, 
if we take the messenger RNA, a lipid shell de delivers the actual virus mRNA into the cell where it is used to produce protein. So the RNA in itself cannot, um, cannot create uh, the virus in its own right. None of these uh, vaccines can do that, cannot cause uh, COVID themselves, but this then can go on uh, to stimulate uh, an immune response to the spike protein. The next big group are the vector-based uh, vaccines. So this can either use a replicating viral vector as the transporter, if you like, it's kind of the taxi to bring uh, the antigen into the into the human uh, frame in order to interact with the human immune system or a non-replicating viral vector. So if you like, this is the, the using another virus as a taxi to bring the antigen into the human host cell. Um, and here foremost are AstraZeneca uh, and of course Janssen, as well as the Sputnik Gamalea from Russia and the CanSino uh, from uh, Beijing. Then we have the subunit pro protein COVID vaccines. Here you use either a virus-like particle, which is an empty viral shell, or a protein subunit. Um, and a part of the virus, a protein part that itself cannot replicate, is then brought into the human host as uh, the antigen of interest. And key here is Novavax, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, what about ant attenuated or weakened virus or killed virus? So these are all age old ways of making vaccines where we modify the virus and make it essentially useless by weakening it or we inactivate it completely by killing it. Um, and of course, even this killed virus can be antigenic uh, and can be very important. And here are the two names that will mean a lot to you are Sinopharm and Sinovac, both coming to us from China um, and uh, both already in circulation around the world. So here you see uh, again where we are in terms of the preclinical all the way through to those that are uh, now licensed for use um, and an extraordinary array of opportunities for vaccines. The WHO has also listed vaccines on their emer emergency use list and I'm going to just dash through these so you know again, because of course the WHO influences us the most here in a low and middle income country. Uh, there's Pfizer, which has shown 52% overall efficacy after one dose, 94% after two doses. There you see Moderna sitting in the mid 90s, AstraZeneca 64% after one dose, 70% after two doses. And then of course the single dose Johnson & Johnson 72% in the USA, 66% in Latin America, and 64%, remembering that that was in the face of our Delta, uh, our beta wave. So we did this study at the time uh, that the beta wave was occurring. Now look at the far right, efficacy against severe disease. Importantly, all the vaccines have incredible impact against severe disease and death. And so that is probably the important thing to keep your eye on uh, as we go on. Uh, and then just to ring fence the two vaccines that are mostly being rolled out in South Africa today. Just to finish the group, Novavax, um, uh, you see that 89%, 60% in South Africa. The Gamma layer, which is a mixture of ADD5 and ADD26, looking good. Um, and efficacious apparently after severe disease. Um, the Sinovac, we, are, we don't have the best data, but there is some data and Sinopharm uh, accordingly as well. Then the, again, the landscape changed and here we are talking about the onset of these variants. So the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. RNA, RNA viruses are very prone to mutation. Uh, they, they, they don't fix themselves, if you like. So all of our genetic material makes mistakes at regular intervals. Doesn't matter which organism we are, but more sophisticated animals have ways of fixing uh, genetic mistakes. RNA vac viruses are less able to do that. And so their mistakes, if you like, stick. 
Um, and so you have a high rate of mutation, which if it favors the well-being of the virus, that mutation will stick. And this is exactly what has happened. So we saw the first variant in the UK, uh, the B117. Then, of course, famously, we had the beta come in, B1351 in South Africa, the P1 in Brazil almost at the same time, um, and then most recently, the Delta or B1617, um, which is, of course, the author of the most recent wave here in South Africa. So thank you to Tulio de la Vera and the team at CRISP. Uh, here you see the onset of the Delta wave in South Africa. So that's in green. And you can see initially it was all beta in the second wave. And then slowly that Delta wave came in and really has taken over in the third wave. Um, and here again by province, you see how particularly in Gauteng and KwaZulu, we saw that Delta wave coming in. And that is, of course, what we have to keep our eye on as we think about these vaccines. So I'm going to ask a number of questions. The first question is, from the data that is available, do vaccines prevent hospitalization or severe COVID-19 with pre-existing variants in the mix? And I would say here, yes, very well. So across the board of our, um, we've, we're missing data on a few of the vaccines, as you see, but certainly in the ones that we have an interest uh, in, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson, we have good data uh, to support both uh, beta um, and, of course, the ancestral strain in that regard. Do vaccines prevent clinically apparent SARS-CoV-2 infection? So this is now you're talking about mild and moderate um, SARS-CoV-2. And here you see, indeed, again, we have reasonable uh, rates here with some very good rates in, in, in the mRNA vaccines. Um, and, and this is well above the 50% mark that the WHO uh, sort of preset in terms of vaccines going forward. What about vaccines being effective against COVID-19 caused by specifically the beta variant, which is on our doorstep at the moment? Certainly here we do see a ding in the, in the effectiveness of the vaccine. So you see AstraZeneca dropping significantly in South Africa with the beta variant. You see uh, Novavax also showing a reduction with the beta variant. Um, and, uh, you know, less of a reduction in the Johnson & Johnson from 72 to 64, and Pfizer seemingly not showing an impact with the beta variant. Uh, there are some other data, for example, from the Middle East, suggesting that that 100% may not hold everywhere. But across the board, certainly in terms of our uh, main vaccines, uh, j, j and Pfizer, we certainly do seem to be okay with beta. Question is now, uh, what about Delta? And I'll come back to that in a moment. But this slide really summarizes where we are with four of the main vaccines in terms of what we know when it comes to the beta variant. And uh, Janssen and Janssen sitting at 64, Novavax 48 to 50 percent, and then that dismal drop in the AstraZeneca. Now, the numbers in both the AstraZeneca and the Novavax trial in South Africa were small um, and, and difficult to interpret that data. You all know the story uh, that occurred in um, earlier this year when we, we had a million dose of Ast AstraZeneca and government had to make a decision about that 10% mark there. Um, and, and I'll go on to describe exactly what happened. We do see reduced effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines against the Delta variant, the most recent of the variants. Um, and the data we've got is with Pfizer um, and with AstraZeneca. So again, we do see a ding here with both uh, with Delta, pretty much as was seen with Beta. Now, I do want to reassure that uh, there is some laboratory data regarding J and J, the single shot J and J, uh, that does bring some reassurance. And so this comes out of Dan Baruch's lab. It is now um, uh, published. It is in vitro or laboratory data. So it is not 
uh, in the field in in you know effectiveness, but it is in the laboratory where it shows that we see comparable immunogenicity to the delta and the beta with the single shot ad 26. And this data now goes out all the way to eight months, uh, showing also durability of the immunogenicity. So very encouraging, um, certainly these data. There has recently been a report out of New York. We're waiting for that to be published. We saw the Medrix, the preprint, uh, that suggests this isn't as robust. But importantly, they took an early snapshot. And one thing we're learning about J&J &J is that it appears to build its immunogenicity over time. So also, if you sample too soon after the vaccine, you may not get the full impact of the vaccine over time. And again, happy to discuss this uh, in a moment. The proof in the pudding, of course, is with actual effectiveness on the ground. And we are starting to see real world vaccine effectiveness studies coming through. And here's just a handful, a selection, uh, unfortunately, all with the mRNA. We are missing uh, more of these studies, particularly with J&J. &J. Uh, we, as I will describe for you in a moment, we are busy doing the analysis of the Sasanki j, j trial here in South Africa, and we expect to be the first real, real-world effectiveness uh, readout for the single-dose j, j and we hope that will be out next week. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. How are the other vaccines doing? This is the co CoronaVac. It's an inactivated COVID-19 vaccine, in other words, one that is uh, weakened or killed. Um, and here you see that, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, it, well, it prevented uh, hospitalization in 87%, prevented ICU admissions at 90.3%, uh, and prevented COVID-related deaths by 86%. So uh, here you see pretty good results of this uh, vaccine. So this is just an example of an effectiveness uh, study. What about effectiveness studies looking at asymptomatic infection? And this starts to get to transmission. So can we actually see an impact on transmission? Now, most of these studies occurred before the big variants uh, hit, but you can see that certainly in terms of the ancestral strain, we were starting to see some quite nice data in this regard. I think a number of these are being rerun now in the face of uh, particularly the Delta variant which, as you know, has, has really gone global. Uh, so we'll be seeing more of this kind of data in the future, but really very reasonable numbers there in terms of stopping actual infection. So let's move on to the second half of this. Where are we going with these vaccines? So the question is, can we achieve global vaccine access equity? Should we mix our vaccines to dose spare? Uh, should we indeed be vaccinating children? So I'm going to cover some of the kind of nitty gritty. And I, I do think vaccine equity is something we need to talk about at a global level, at a country level, at a population level, uh, by socioeconomic status, and of course, at an individual level. And vaccine equity really speaks to the equitable distribution of vaccines worldwide. So this is where we sit. Um, at the moment, um, and 3.66 billion doses have been distributed. Uh, but sadly, uh, and this means more than a quarter of the world population, but only 1% of low income countries have actually received a vaccine. Of course, Africa sits there very pale uh, in the global world. So I would say that as a global community, we have really ticked the box in the need to create a vaccine. We've uh, moved the dial incredibly fast. I think what we have done less well is delivered a vaccine in a global kind of way. So when it comes to production capacity, supply chains, human resources, health infrastructure, etc., cetera, um, particularly in an equitable global way, I think we have done less well. We wrote this um, in the NEJM a little while ago. Um, and spoke about how 80% of the population in low and re, re, low resource settings are not expected to receive a vaccine this year. Really, um, uh, very uh, sadly so. Uh, when we look at what goes into a global COVID vaccine strategy, 
It is a mixture of development and production, affordability, allocation, and deployment, of course. And here you see each of those characteristics by vaccine, um, and, and you can see how they, they, they do. Um, so, of course, deployment is affected by how many doses have to be given, how much refrigeration is required, what the supply chain is like. Allocation is going to depend a lot on cost, um, as well as where those vaccines are being bought and how they're being distributed. Um, and of course, manufacture, really a major, major problem. So vaccine manufacturing capability is shown in the blue bars by country. And then those countries that are actually dominating COVID-19 vaccine production is shown on the red bars. And here you see the USA has the greatest capability, but in fact, China uh, seems to be winning uh, in that regard. But you can, I think just for your benefit, uh, you can see, and I'm very happy to share these slides if the Winter School allows that after, after this. Look at cost. Um, and some of you may have seen that Pfizer is now very much promoting and happy to hear that um, uh, Israel is recommending a third dose of Pfizer. And I'm sure, you know, looking at their bottom line, how much money they've made this year, uh, they quite, you know, perhaps uh, without being too cynical, uh, it makes a lot of sense that they would want to sell more vaccine. Uh, the most expensive being Moderna. Um, and there you see them uh, sort of coming through all the way to Chadox at $4. Um, so when we choose and, and how do we really see the greatest global reach, it is going to be a number of factors such as cost, storage conditions, um, and of course approvals uh, and how fast regulators move. So uh, as well as safety, safety is going to be really critical uh, in all of that. So there are factors such as cost on the one hand um, and then safety concerns on the other hand. So how far have we come in achieving global access to these vaccines? So these are the doses administered per 100 people. And of course, here North America leads the way. Africa, sadly, lagging uh, painfully behind. Um, and again, the bottom graph really just bringing this home in terms of this unevenness in terms of access to vaccines. Now, COVAX was brought about early on with the mandate that this was a fast moving pand pandemic and no one was safe unless everyone is safe. So it's a joint initiative of global health bodies, including, including Gavi and the World Health Organization with two primary functions, to generate the development of COVID-19 vaccines and to ensure vaccine equity. Their goal to supply 20% of the population of the, of the countries that are part of COVAX. And COVAX incentivized the research and development of COVID-19 vaccines, as well as negotiating the price paid for them. In other words, thinking that if this was ne negotiated as a block, uh, it would be more effective than if countries were coming one on one. Um, and uh, of course, it is a multilateral charitable uh, system dependent on the alignment of powerful state interests. Um, the idea is, is equity ensured through self-financing states who pay into the model and then can draw um, uh, from, from that model um, uh, through funded states where official development assistance is used to support the COVAX advanced market commitment mechanism, ensuring 20% of doses uh, occur in those low and middle income states. And for high income countries that participate in the scheme, it really is an insurance mechanism should their bilateral agreements fall out. For low income countries, it really is a lifeline uh, to access vaccines. Now, uh, recently we had the good news that another 187, 870 million doses were donated to COVAX. Um, and this came out of the G7 uh, discussions. Um, but who estimates that 11 billion doses are needed to vaccinate the world to a level of 70%? And many have argued that COVAX has fallen dismally short of, of, of what is needed. Um, so really raising quite a lot of controversial uh, thoughts about this. 
it really does raise what is needed, perhaps may, maybe not for this pandemic, but certainly for the next pandemic. And certainly, uh, you know, I think it behoves us to think about a long term view. What are the institutional mechanisms to to ensure vaccine access? What are the data and analytic needs? What what is the workforce deployment? What is the preparedness? Um, and how do we come? How do we roll with issues such as viral variants? Um, and of course, it raises this very hot potato of the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights, etc. So here is a paper from AVAC that really says, in order to break the bottlenecks in vaccine access, we have to think about intellectual property, uh, transfer technology, lift embargoes, invest in manufacturing capacity, continue with our R&D, and of course, share surplus, uh, which we're not necessarily hearing too much about, although happily, the US will be supplying some vaccines to us uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. So what exactly is this about the intellectual property? Well, it, many recognize that the cost of medicines is seen as the root problem of access to vaccines and other uh, biomedical technologies. And so this is a campaign for a temporary suspension or waiver of intellectual property rights. Um, uh, under the TRIPS agreement of the World Trade Organization for all medical products required to fight this pandemic or indeed any pandemic. And South Africa and India put forward a proposal for a vaccine waiver. Um, however, to date, this has been blocked and I'm sure you've just seen that the, uh, the EU has gone on holiday for August. So this, is, this can has again been kicked down the road. This is a a conversation piece that I read with interest, you might want to go back and look at that again, uh, where quite controversially people suggested, these authors suggested the alternative may be to issue compulsory licenses to produce own vaccines in a country, set up bilateral agreements with those states that have production capacity. Of course, you know South Africa has now moved to do that, build vaccine blocks uh, to negotiate and supply vaccines um, and disrupt power relations within supply chains by breaking confidentiality clauses, talking about how much the vaccines cost, uh, etc. Pleased to say we saw this, that both biotech um, and of course uh, the, the Aspen uh, unit in, uh, in South Africa are, are now being given some kind of tech transfer. Um, and we may well start to see at least finish and fill happening and hopefully even more technology being transferred over time. But of course, this is going to take a great deal of time. So let's move to access within countries. And I want to just speed up quickly here. Who's at risk of being left behind? Um, and this speaks to um, who doesn't get to get to the vaccine. So that might be because of cold chain supply inadequate access to vaccine distribution clinics, the digital divide, people can't get on to uh, digital registration systems. Um, there may be limited appointments. Uh, they may only work during the week and people can't miss work. Uh, the need to return, of course, for the second dose, undocumented individuals, and of course, where there are safety issues, uh, people may be left behind, including, for example, pregnant people. South Africa, of course, rolling out mostly the single dose J&J and the mRNA vaccine known as Pfizer, BioNTech. Um, and we have taken a strategy of prioritizing people um, in order to get this, as most countries have done. So prioritizing different categories of risk. First of all, starting with the healthcare sector, uh, then, of course, moving down through age. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, and that prioritization particularly becomes important uh, when you have a rationed commodity such as a vaccine. And much has been said recently about this. Um, this is a paper by Moodley in the SMJ asking for fair distribution among tertiary, secondary and primary levels of care um, and other considerations uh, to be thought about. This is what our VAC, MAC uh, and others and the NDOH have uh, settled on that we have a phase one where healthcare workers are first 
identified then phase two with essential workers and people over 60. We did have this aspect of the comorbidities, uh, but of course we then, uh, that phase two would include essential workers, people in congregate settings and people with comorbidities. But right at the beginning of the program, we saw that in fact, comorbidities were taken out. And the reason was, I think that the NDOH felt that age was a good uh, surrogate for comorbidities and it was very difficult to prioritize people on comorbidities. And this might be something we want to discuss in a moment. Of course, when we look at which people are dying of, uh, of COVID, this is just one um, study out of the Western Cape, which shows that, of course, age is an important factor, uh, but of diabetes is another very important factor, cardiovascular disease, another one. And of course, spoken about recently because of a large WHO study, we know that those people living with HIV also have increased vulnerability to COVID uh, um, and, and may need to be think about, uh, thought about for prioritization. When it comes to other diseases, such as the autoimmune diseases, we really are in a data-free zone in terms of vaccines, in terms of their benefit and their risk. Um, and, and so we, you know, we lack trial data. Um, we presume that there's good benefit, but we really don't have a lot of data. However, the world, um, and here's the CDC recommendation, is that People with autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid, in, and I think this applies also to cancer conditions, they should receive a COVID-19 vaccine, but they do need to understand that we don't always have great safety data in this regard. And here's um, our good friend, Dr. Fauci, who also says um, some degree of immunity is better than no degree of immunity. Of course, what we don't know here is how robustly these individuals with immune suppression may uh, develop um, an immune response and they may be compromised. But as he says, and I would totally concur with this, get the vaccine on board because some may be better than none at all. So there is lack of evidence for safety and efficacy of vaccines in many autoimmune conditions. But I think across the board, and I've looked at numerous guidelines now, the recommendation is to administer COVID-19 vaccines, um, obviously, preferably in conjunction with, with their care providers. Let's move to this difficult uh, piece, and that is the breakthrough infections. So. Uh, are, are these vaccines 100%? No. We know that they, none of the COVID vaccines prevent infection 100%. In fact, you saw that some of them are really uh, quite below par in that regard. Um, some, uh, most in fact, don't even prevent completely severe disease. We do see some severe disease still occurring. Um, in many cases, and this is the Israeli study, it may be due to the virus that is uh, circulating at the time. And of course, now they, are pro they have problems with the Delta virus, uh, but it may also be that those individuals who have breakthrough have other comorbidities which put them at risk. So on the one hand, we really want this group to be protected, but on the other hand, they may well be the group who are less well protected simply because they can't mount the same kind of immune response uh, that healthy populations would. So here is the ongoing sort of vaccine conundrum. Um, and indeed, in this group, we may need ongoing or further protection in the way of booster vaccinations in order to assure better rates of protection. And of course, here, Israel will be offering a Pfizer booster um, and they've decided to move ahead in the over 60s. What about mixing COVID vaccines? So on the one hand, so the idea here is you prime with one vaccine and you boost with another. And of course, this becomes helpful when you really do have rationed vaccines, uh, when you don't have enough. You, you might have take whatever you can off the shelf uh, rather than sticking with Pfizer and Pfizer or AZ and AZ. So this might enable, first of all, when vaccines are in short supply to, to get more vaccines to more people, but also we may enhance 
an immune response if we have a heterologous prime boost. So where you have one vaccine uh, do priming and another vaccine boosting, you may broaden your immune response. Now, just to say, uh, these studies are ongoing. We have very little data coming through yet. Um, I imagine that in the next little while, we will see a lot more data in this regard and welcome it greatly. Um, but uh, we don't yet have great data. It is coming. Quickly, what about other ethical problems such as wastage? Um, and of course, this does occur when at the end of the day, there aren't arms, uh, va vaccines have been drawn up. It does happen that vaccines might be wasted. I was just on a on a Digicon with uh, the Premier of the Western Cape and the and uh, Dr. Clutie, and it's very clear that here in the Western Cape, this is not happening. The su supply and demand are very closely matched and we actually aren't keeping up with demand. Um, and so we aren't seeing too much of this, but this can happen. Um, and here's an interesting concept where you put people on standby um, and they may not be a prioritized group, but they get the call to say, come in and get your vaccine and they come in immediately and get vaccinated. And that's happening in Italy. Some countries, of course, have had to destroy or return vaccines, either because they've exceeded an expiry date or a cold chain has been broken or some other problem has occurred. And so it's just important to know that on the one hand, whilst we don't have enough manufacturing capability, on the other hand, uh, we have these other issues such as expiry dates and loss of cold chain, which can have a, an impact. Why is it important to think about equity? Well, of course, on for health reasons, if we can vaccinate the whole world, we reduce the global death toll. We reduce the emergence of new variants, very importantly, and we set a precedent for future global health endeavors where we do say everybody, uh, you know, needs an equal shot at, at these um, public health measures. Uh, on an economic front, it, su it supports global economic recovery and, of course, mitigates supply chain interruptions. Um, and then on a social front, it strengthens, uh, you know, political diplomacy, uh, rejects nationalist sentiments. Um, and of course, uh, we don't perpetuate these deepening global health and economic inequalities. Very contentious. What about vaccinating children, given that teenagers and children have had less severe COVID-19 disease by and large than adults? Uh, they have a lower risk of death. Um, so do we, if you like, want to waste vaccines on this group? On the other hand, we know that severity doesn't necessarily uh, predict long COVID and young people have been hit hard with, with long COVID. Um, the vaccines, uh, although reassuring in terms of uh, vaccines in young people, we have seen some rare, very rare uh, vaccine events. And so, you know, if your risk benefit ratio is a little bit less clear, you may want to think about safety uh, as an issue in that setting. Um, on the other hand, again, vaccinating children contributes to herd immunity. Um, and so I would argue that if we don't allow children to get infected or, or, or stop them getting infected, uh, then we certainly should provide vaccination. Otherwise, when they hit adulthood, uh, they're going to be naive in this regard. So, you know, these are some of the considerations that I really just drop into your thought processes uh, to think about more deeply around this question of children um, and vaccination. Um, here is just one paper about safety and efficacy in adolescence. And we know that uh, the countries to the north of us are moving now to vaccinate uh, their over 12 year olds. Um, and so certainly, uh, we know that immune uh, responses are, are very robust. The younger you are, we senesce in terms of our immune system. So the older we get, the less well our immune systems work. So we do see robust uh, responses, and that may be at the heart of some of the, the safety issues we've been seeing, such as the pericarditis and the myocarditis. It may just be an over 
robust response of the immune response uh, the immune responses in these young people to the vaccine uh, but on the whole these have been uh, declared safe um, and uh, and and can be used so as you know these are also now being licensed for these age groups last few contentious points what about vaccine passports um, to travel, to gym, to eat out, to return to work. And I was very interested to listen to Dr. Uh, to Mr. Biden, this President Biden this morning saying that government workers in America will now require vac vaccines or they have to be tested weekly. Um, so quite interesting how this area is moving forward. Um, obviously on the pro side, this kind of thing incentivizes people to get vaccinated. It is also a systematic way to reopen the economy, et cetera. On the negative side, um, you know, it, it, it raises exclusionary and equity type issues again, particularly for countries which may, through no fault of their own, be able to access vaccines um, in an equitable way. What about this thing of vaccine hesitancy? Well, that is a lecture all in its own, but just to raise uh, that there certainly has been concern about this. Uh, and then we have seen evidence of this in the United States, particularly in the, the red states, um, significant vaccine hesitancy. Um, thought it would be very high in low and middle income countries. I don't think that is playing out to the same extent. Um, and, and I think people, as what we're finding is that as vaccines become available, uh, people are stepping up, uh, although a significant amount of anti-vax sentiment uh, does exist out there. Here is one of the kind of upsides of vaccines, and this has just occurred in, in England, where a day was declared Freedom Day, where people could go out without masks as long as they were vaccinated, and get on with this. Again, very controversial, a lot said about this, um, both pros and cons, um, and I think really does raise a number of very interesting aspects of this current epidemic. Um, sorry, I um, repeated that. I want to remind you all that the purpose of COVID-19 vac vaccines are, number one, to keep the essential workforce on its feet, to protect the vulnerable from severe disease and death, to prevent severe disease and death in the general population after we've protected those who are most vulnerable, and then to move towards herd immunity, either through pre-existing immunity with cross-reaction um, and wild-type infection in the background, as well as mass vaccination. And here we're talking about 70 to 80 percent of the population being vaccinated. We did, as you know, take this on at Sasanki to say, we urgently need to vaccinate our healthcare workers in the face of an oncoming third wave. Um, and so we started doing this on the 17th of February. By the 17th of May, we had vaccinated almost 500,000 healthcare workers, most from the front line. Um, and we did that through 95 sites, as I say, reaching 480,000 healthcare workers. The value beyond protecting those healthcare workers, we can now do the effectiveness study. So it is a 3B study. It is designed to look at the effectiveness of that single dose in healthcare workers. Um, and I'm pleased to say uh, that we are undertaking that at the moment. So we have a period of effectiveness evaluation from the 17th of February to the 17th of July. Um, and we are feverishly, literally at this moment, doing the analysis. We hope to have a number, a point estimate for you for severe disease and death, as well as hospitalization, as well as overall infection by next week. We are using a series of databases to do this. It really is a big operation, looking at death registers, at hospitalization data, at medical scheme data, to put this all together. Um, and what I can tell you as a teaser is um, that we are confident that the J&J single dose is holding up. Um, we do know that it worked very well in the phase three randomized controlled trial, and we are happy that more durability data will be coming out of that trial in August. So watch that space. We do have lab based immune response data that looks very uh, impressive. It is now in print, uh, in a preprint. It's at 
it's for consideration by a journal um, and it shows good responses um, out to eight months. Um, we see surprising durability, as I say, out to eight months. And um, the, the important thing is we will have real world effectiveness studies, as I say, within seven to 10 days. I don't want you to forget that other diseases have suffered through the lockdown and the difficulties of the last pandemic. And this is just to bring this to your attention. This is a global health, a global fund report on the impact um, and, and a WHO study to look at the impact of, uh, of COVID on HIV, on ARVs, on condom distribution, on a mother to child uh, vertical transmission reduction. And all of these have been affected by the COVID uh, epidemic. So really finding our way out of it is very important. And I um, am in the, the group that say vaccinate, vaccinate. Um, there's lots for us to work out how we prioritize who's in the queue, when they're in the queue. There's much to think about. In the meantime, though, we can get on with vaccination. So here are my take homes. Vaccines and pre-existing immunity is an only, I think, exit strategy for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we must go fast and to scale to reduce the risk of variants and to get as many people uh, protected as we can, as fast as we can. We need to exploit maximum immunity from a vaccine regimen, whether one or two doses that we can before we think about any boosting or any other strategies. So let's get the best we can out of what we've got. Uh, infection, unfortunately, is inevitable. You did not see any of those vaccines that were 100% across the board. So we are going to have to learn to live with some infection. It's important we maximally protect the vulnerable from severe disease. And we continue and strengthen surveillance of virus and vaccine efficacy, particularly in the face of these variants. So those are my take homes. Uh, if you don't like any of them, as I say, you can leave them at the door and I'll end there and thank you all for your attention. I'm sorry about our technical difficulties at the beginning, um, but I'm delighted to have given you this talk and I'm very happy uh, to share these slides with you and anyone who's interested. Thank you very much. I'm just checking if there are any questions. Professor, excuse me, I missed this in your technic, uh, in the, with the te technical difficulties. What do you think we should expect as a country? How many people would we have vaccinated by July next year? Well, I, you know, I, I think w w the VACMAC and everyone else was hopeful that by the end and the NDOH that by the end of the year, we would be moving towards herd immunity. Um, I was a little bit um, uh, cynical about that, just looking at the flow of vaccines. Um, but I have seen those picking up. Plus, we've had a few bonuses, such as the US donation that's coming in. Um, I think perhaps certainly by your date of July next year, I would hope that we will have had sufficient vaccines in that we could have vaccinated, you know, those folk who want to be vaccinated up and one would hope that that's approaching 70% of our population. But I think, um, you know, we, we're going to have to see how things go. The Western Cape, which I'm most familiar with at the moment, I know that they have in their radar, on their radar to get to 250,000 um, uh, doses uh, a week. Um, and they've been, you know, just shy of that, about 190, 160. Their biggest problem has been vaccine supply. And so as long as that supply keeps coming, I think we can meet, uh, you know, our targets. Um, but it does mean we have to have enough supply to open up more vaccine centers. I know, again, the Western Cape has the most in the country. Um, it seems to me that places like Gauteng, needs to up their game. They have the most people. So this is this is what's going to depend on it um, happening. So, so so just to clarify, the, rest, uh, the restriction will be the supply of vaccines rather than people not wanting to get it, in your opinion? Uh, 
I would hope so. I mean, again, I'm using the Western Cape as the example here. It seems that as people hear other people getting it um, and they're not, you know, dropping dead, they're not turning blue, they're not getting purple hair, as somebody suggested maybe <laughs> was a side effect that I had uh, had incurred the other day very rudely on Twitter, um, that, you know, they, they, will, um, they will take it up. Uh, but I can tell you, listening to the Digicon yesterday, Kai Leacher uh, was about 40, 30 percent of the group who could get vaccines had registered similar Mitchell's plan. So we've got pockets, a little bit like America, pockets of, of the Western Cape and I presume pockets in the country. I know the Eastern Cape has had a higher level of vaccine hesitancy. So I think we have to keep working very hard. Um, at building vaccine confidence. Really very important that we have good comms in this regard, good, you know, information, uh, and that we all become advocates uh, at our dinner tables, at our with our neighbours, uh, on every opportunity. Thank you. Hello there. Thank you so much for that. It covered the whole vaccine thing from the point of view, you know, of, 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 the, the logistics and uh, and so on, and presumes that uh, that people do want it. So as you've been talking, the, the the hesitancy is a big issue. I just want to ask you something about that. Overall, if you take somebody who's uh, say about forty years old, very healthy, takes a whole lot of um, uh, you know uh, supplements and so on, um, for that individual, would you say that his his risk of um, of uh, you know any any uh, sort of severe after effects is is less if he doesn't take the vaccine for a special individual who is you know after just for him after effects of COVID or after effects yeah. of the vaccine no, after, uh, so, so. all together because the vaccine right. may have some uh, some things we don't know yet about because uh, you know we haven't followed them for more than a year or so so um yes in your view overall in let's say in 10 years time the overall risk to a healthy person just looking at him not the population just that individual I would say, so yeah and i would ask what is his age and what 40 is his, i said 40 40, 40 years and old. his availability yeah. his his ability to shelter in place how how likely is excellent he to, excellent in, in other words if he well what do you mean by that uh, what do you he mean doesn't by have that? to he doesn't have to go to work he doesn't have to be he cannot he doesn't have to go to restaurants in other words he can make sure he doesn't get exposed because if he gets exposed he is almost certainly going to get infected okay uh the delta variant yes. has been extraordinary um, yes and the predictor of 40 years certainly um you know we've seen people get severe disease at age 40 um and you know some have died as, as you well know that it far outweighs the risk of side effects as we know it and i hear what you're saying we've only got a year of follow-up for the vaccine but we have given it to almost four billion people around the world so certainly any side effects in in one year seem to be vanishingly rare um and therefore i would say without doubt for a 40 year old even because of his age even if he's well even if he's fit even if he's taking supplements he his risk of having severe disease ending up in an icu and dying possibly is much greater than any worry about getting a side effect from a vaccine much much greater oh that's a very very nice summary thank you for that uh, one one also particular thing is the the, the this talk about uh, a person having the the vaccine and then becoming very infectious uh you know and uh, is there any truth in that have we no. seen uh, any numbers no, so on that yeah, let, let me explain what that is about. In fact, what we think is that if you're vaccinated and you become infected, you're more likely to have less of a viral load. Um, now, that is a little bit in dispute. You know, we haven't got good data on that, but that, you know, there's a pathogenesis for that. So if, you, if you've if you got an immunity, you the virus comes in and it, you have a breakthrough infection, there is still some derived benefit from that immunity. So that hopefully will translate into reduced viral load, which will 
then render you actually less infectious to the next individual. The problem is you may have such a low viral load that you are asymptomatic. So now you can infect Joe Soap, um, you know, with the virus, even though you're asymptomatic. And that's where the worry is that you are, you are quietly, silently infectious, whereas you would have, you know, gone to bed because you felt sick from the COVID or indeed even gone to hospital. Um, so that needs to be weighed up. So we, we, we're still figuring that out. Now, there is a theory that if enough of you are vaccinated and you are all reducing your viral load appropriately, you will begin to break transmission chains because less, less what we talk about community viral load, the whole lot of us all have a lower viral load that hopefully will play into less virus being passed around but that also needs still to be tested for covid it's it's a principle that exists in 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 you know communicable diseases uh, but but we haven't tested it for covid yet although uh, you know before delta i think we were seeing reports coming out of israel out of the us saying we're starting to see less transmission of virus. And so I think there is a, you know, we were starting to see the impact. The Delta variant, of course, threw that a little bit. And so this is going to be our other big uh, problem is chasing those variants. But isn't that the same as, as, as a herd immunity effect, what you're saying? Correct. Now? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So okay. ultimately, we want to get to herd immunity. You can get to herd immunity in two ways. You can do it by allowing the population to get infected, which is effectively what happened in 1918, right? But many people died. A lot of people had to die in order to get sufficiently people, uh, you know, exposed. The vaccine offsets that. So we can contribute to background immunity by vaccinating large numbers of people. That will, um, if you like, synergize with the, the, the previous infection. And so together, you know, you get, a, and also we get the added benefit that if you get vaccinated on top of pre-existing uh, disease, you, you, you get a bang for your buck. It's almost like a, a boost in a way. So you get a better, okay. better response. Okay, so you sorry to dominate this, but I see there's no other questions. Just want to go a little bit further. So you the, you you now your last section you're considering the population as a whole, the, the humanity as a whole. But if you take an individual um, who uh, you know who who has who has not had the who has had the vaccine and may for various reasons interesting that they might may not know they've got covered and then therefore become a spreader in, in an unconscious spreader um uh, more than they would have otherwise um uh, so they would then be they would then be at, they would then the, the, the their partners or their their families their their close contacts would therefore be at more at risk from them having had the 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 the, the um the the the, the uh, vaccine, no? It, you know, it is, it's, it's theoretical, but the other way to fix that is everybody at home gets vaccinated as well, right? So, so you know, this yeah. is why I was quite, ex quite expressed to say we must protect our most vulnerable first with vaccines. So that is your age, your people with comorbidities, the people at home, they must be vaccinated. And that's why, you know, the government took that strategy of age first, um, and within those age ranks, if we can get comorbidities in first, that's great. Let's get those people protected. We then say, what is the benefit of a broader vaccine strategy? What is what is the other bonuses we can get um, in, in addition? But the most important thing is to protect those who are most at risk of, of death and dying. Yeah, um, but you see... Um, if you have a situation where you've got a, a, a community or a family where some are hesitant and 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 uh, uh, and the others are possibly um, possibly um, uh, 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 vulnerable, uh, you've got this conflict of of the vulnerable person who gets the vaccine could inadvertently become more infectious and therefore. Um, is more of a danger no, to the. So very, very, very important to say, not more infectious. Um, they, they, they just. I mean, and again, this is highly theoretical. 
they may be an asymptomatic spreader. We yes. know they're already asymptomatic spreaders it, throughout this epidemic, right? Um, you know, I, I was just looking at lab data this morning. We have a, we're doing a study. We had a bunch of people came in who decreed themselves asymptomatic. And, you know, five out of the 12 people actually had PCR positive. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, they had had contacts, they had been in contact with people. So we know this virus does exist in an asymptomatic form. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, I, I think it's a small price to pay, <laughs> you know, to add a few more of those if indeed we have more individuals protected from severe disease and death. Yes, but once again, that comment is go that comment is looking at a uh, at a global, uh, you know, mass situation. No, no, this is for that individual's benefit. That individual has protected themselves against severe disease and death. That is really yes, 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 yeah, uh, yes. But they, but they, but they, yes. But the, so the point is, what about the people close to them who are vaccine hesitant? So you know, they they are now more. Do, are they not on theoretically more vulnerable? You know, potentially. I, I mean, I'm not going to argue that point, but I, you know, yeah. weigh it up. I mean, they're also, if they're going out on a bus, they might uh, be exposed to asymptomatic individuals anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so my argument being that I think each individual should take the decision for themselves. For me, it's a no brainer. I mean, do I want to end up on an ICU? No. Um, get vaccinated. It's 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 just a no brainer. Um, but I understand people are anxious. We need to answer their anxieties, give them the facts, um, and you know, and each each person should take the decision for themselves. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was really informative, and thank you to the audience. Take care. Have a good Bye. one.